broadcasting from the Unshackled Studios in Melbourne. This is Wilms Front, brought to you by the Unshackled.net. Now here's Tim Wilms. Uh, to discuss the historical wiping of film and comedy, my first uh, featured guest on this week's Films Front is someone who lives, works and breathes for film, uh, Paul Moda. His specialty is gory special effects. Paul won the Best Gratuitous Use of Violence Award for his work on the 2003 Australian exploitation film Bullet in the Arse at the 2003 Melbourne Underground Film Festival. That festival name right, might sound familiar to followers of The Unshackled as it is uh, operated by Report from Tiger Mountain host uh, Richard Wollstonecroft. We just uploaded a new report on The Unshackled YouTube channel this morning uh, commenting on the, well, as I've already said, the, the, the strange uh, segue from uh, COVID uh, to race riots. Uh, Paul is currently in pre-production on Wasp, the Port Arthur Film Massacre, uh, which is about, as the title says, about Australia's 1996 uh, Port Arthur Massacre carried out by Martin Bryan, who murdered 35 people at the historical penal colony site in southeast Tasmania. Paul, welcome to Wilmsfront. Hello, welcome. Uh, now... Uh, I, my first question should sh should be: uh, How big is your uh, DVD uh, collection, and you've got have you got a, a preservation uh, plan? Since the 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 online world is 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 currently going through a, as I said, wiping process. Um, I remember the um, early nineteen seventies film Fahrenheit four five one, based on the famous book by Ray Bradbury, and um, of course the notion in that in that film was that books were banned and were illegal and were burnt, a very political statement um, made in that film. And in the end, um, the main character finds his way to an isolated community who've dedicated themselves to memorising books and they walk around reciting books and storing them in the one supposedly um, unbreakable vault, which is the human memory and the human mind. Um, I hope it doesn't come down to that. Um, and I certainly believe that given modern technology, there are ways to preserve art and history in all its forms. And uh, that is something that we should always fight for uh, because the current trend towards erasing and or destroying that is, in my opinion, the greatest obscenity of the 21st century. I've uh, put together uh, in this uh, studio my newly banned DVD collection. I've got, well, the full Chris Lilly coll collection is initial <laughs> one. Uh, we Can Be Heroes, where well, he has the character Ricky Wong, uh, uh, the, the Asian PhD student. So that's yellow face. That, that, that's bad. Wait, I must avert my eyes. <sighs> now I can look. Uh, and of course, uh, Summer Heights High uh, with... Well, no, nobody's upset with him having woman faces, uh, Jamee King, or would you say gay face with uh, Mr. G. Uh, but of course, uh, Jonah from Tonga wearing the, or you'd just say brown face. That's that's his his cardinal uh, sin there. So that's been been pulled as well. And uh, of course, possibly, or oh, his even more offensive series, uh, Angry uh, Boys, which well. Uh, Smouse is the 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 African American uh, rapper. Uh, th this is this is HD uh, blackface uh, Blu-ray. That's that, that that's even worse. And then of it's course, ultra clear, 4K version blackface. Yeah. And then of course, uh, Tropic Thunder, that uh, satirical a, a Vietnam War movie uh, where Robert Downey Jr. Uh, wears. Blackface, it was directed by uh, Ben Stiller, uh, that has also been pulled, and well, of course, uh, I've also got probably the most offensive uh, DVD cover ever produced, uh, Little Britain Season 3 with uh, Bubbles and, and Desiree uh, on the front. They've also been wiped, and the creators, uh, Matt Lucas and David Williams, have basically apologised for this artistic endeavour, which is absolutely what you should not do. Interestingly enough, one of the most award-winning UK comedies was um, called Brass Eye. Um, and I was over in England with a friend and he showed me a few episodes. And in terms of just reaching that line and then crossing over to that line, 
brass eye certainly went there and it, it just had some incredible sketches with pedophilia and the whole thing. Oh, yeah. Um, but it was an award-winning uh, comedy. Um, so I guess back in those those days, it wasn't that long ago, um, uh, comedy that pushed the envelope was considered to be uh, a virtue to culture as opposed to something that should be removed from it. Well, that's because in the, the 80s and 90s, that was the, well, the, the social conservatives, the, the, the Christians through their, what is it, uh, Parents Television Council, they were the, the, the snowflakes and easily offended uh, back in those days. And uh, that was also the time when those, those crude cartoons launched, such as, well, The Simpsons, which is still going, South Park and Family Guy, because South Park, uh, which is, it's still politically incorrect to this day, it was launched to, to basically offend uh, the snowflake uh, Christian uh, conservatives by having these foul mouth uh, schoolboys. But now it's uh, against the, the, the woke SJW snowflakes now. It's it's consistently been against uh, censorship, political correctness, and the easily offended. But the 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 political or the the side of politics which is now offended has now changed. Look, I think one thing I want to do before we launch into this is talk about um, one of the notions at the moment, uh, particularly for the last part of the twentieth century and beginning of the 20th century, is this whole thing of, of labelling. Um, just the way we're talking at the moment, um, you know, we have to have a label for everything. There's SJWs, there's leftists, there's politically incorrect. There's uh, labels are just, there's a plethora of labels now. Um, and it just seems like people are applying them willy-nilly to anything. And the very nature of that is that it firstly um, judges a situation or a person and then can place them in a basket where they can be condemned or praised, whichever that does, whatever agenda that suits. And then secondly, um, it can create division, which it certainly does. So now we've got that group against that group, these people over here against those people. So the first thing I'd like to say is labelling should be removed um, as much as possible in terms of that appellation that then um, cements you to a certain um, belief or cause uh, as much as possible or at least have the judgmental element of that removed because otherwise we, we talk around just pointing things at everybody and going oh that's a Nazi that's an SJW and that's that and that's this um, the human animal is not like that um, we've all got shades of black and white they're all one big massive shade of grey if you want to talk about colour so I can't stand labels. I think labels are wrong and I think that they give uh, just ammunition for people who want to create um, division and, and do the old divide and conquer. And it's working like a charm. Uh, so how would you describe these, well, uh, 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 these historical wipers, uh, as I call them? Uh, do you, it, You've just said you don't like labels, but obviously there are people out there who, who want to uh, destroy how historical uh, film and, and comedy. I would say they're not a type of person. I would just say they've, there are people that have been manipulated and exploited. So they're carrying out endeavours and um, espousing beliefs because they have been manipulated and exploited. Um, if you consider a lot of the elements that, that are supposedly pushing dynamic change in today's society. It's all a stem from a place of, well, this has to change. It's been that way for a long time and now it has to change. Whereas I do remember times when it never seemed to be a problem. Um, and that went right back to the time when, you know, kids were running around being crazy little balls of energy and everyone sort of went, oh yeah, he's just a bit nuts and a bit crazy. Now, you know, they've all got AHAD, um, anxiety disorder, this, that. So now they've got a condition, whereas back then we were just fucked up little balls of energy. Yeah. Um, so labelling uh, basically has just relegated the people that are so-called progressives who believe that they are the chosen people, for want of a better term, to just being uh, people that have been manipulated and tricked into something that they may not necessarily have been believed in in the first place. That's my belief. I have, have always, my core value is I'm a free speech absolutist. And I mentioned those 
labels that you didn't like. Uh, they've at the at the time uh, there was uh, during the eighties and nineties. I mentioned there uh, uh, there were people uh, against free speech, wanting to enact censorship. Uh, they're a different, I'll use the term demographic uh, in the, the 2010s and now uh, 2020s. My uh, position hasn't changed. I'm still a free speech absolutist. It doesn't matter where the, the, the censors and uh, destroyers of, uh, of art come from. I'm uh, against them because uh, you cannot suppress human crea creativity. You should not uh, destroy history. And the reason I should give an historical context, the reason why I call it wiping is because there was this incredibly horrific uh, practice in the early days of the, the BBC in the 50s, 60s, and even 70s, when once they aired programs, because they still had those, you probably know the correct term, those, those massive uh, film reels uh, because they thought that nobody would ever uh, want to watch them or they'd be aired ever again. They uh, destroyed them, wiped them so they could reuse them, so they could uh, use them to store other things. And well, to somebody like me, that just breaks my heart. The fact that, well, Doctor Who, for example, they're still missing episodes of that classic program because the BBC destroyed them. I think there's a distinct difference between that where um, perhaps the cultural significance of programs that were created back then were not considered to be uh, as highly regarded as other projects. And so um, they would say, I'll oh, listen for production reasons or, or me reasons of economy, let's just reuse the tapes and so on. There's a big difference. Between oh, I know there's a difference, but I'm just saying... Oh, that that's wrong. We've got to destroy it. The both um, practices are equally offensive to me, the destruction. In their own way, yeah. I guess one one was not so much uh, intentioned from mm. a more premeditated um, and, in my opinion, malevolent point of view of just saying, I don't want people to see that, therefore I'll erase it, as opposed to somebody saying, oh, look, we've got all these old, dusty old... Uh, video cassettes over here, let's put them through the bulk eraser and use them again so we can save money. Um, yeah, they, um, I applaud, you know, people like Martin Scorsese who've undertaken a, a lifetime um, second vocation to restore and, and retrieve lost films, lost um, TV programs and, and entertainment, and that is fantastic. So, yeah, it's, it's a tragedy that when, you know, I guess philosophically it's a tragedy when any art form is lost and lost irretrievably. Um, and you can say the same for species of animals, all sorts of things. Nobody likes to lose things that are beautiful and important. Uh, sometimes it happens. Um, but it should be, as much as possible, we should try to prevent that because the, the charter of the human race is chronicled by what's come before and uh, you know what we leave behind um, basically propels us into a future. And of course, anybody wanting to learn in the future, they say, learn from the past, learn the lessons of history from the past. You can't very well do that if they're no longer there. Well, we're still, you talk about extinction of, of animals, we're, we're, we're still hold out hope that there's some Tasmanian tiger out in the, the, the Tasmanian wilderness. There's a reward to see if the, the species uh, still exists. So I get what you mean in that regard. Yeah, I mean, look, it's, it's a tragedy. I think also being very philosophical about things, once again, you know, things die. Things are lost. Um, civilizations have been lost. Some things will never be reclaimed. One of the greatest tragedies of um, mankind was the destruction of the, the Great Library of Alexandria in um, ancient Greece, um, of which purportedly the remaining surviving 10% of what was in that library now, um, from that created the all the knowledge that we know today. So you sometimes wonder what was lost in the 90% that was destroyed. So it is a tragedy, but it's also, there's a fragility to life and there is a transient um, aspect to life where things don't last forever. Sometimes they die and maybe they're meant to die. Um, and I guess you could argue, you know, maybe the, um, the people that want to destroy the truth or the, or the past are arguing, well, look, it's redundant now. We don't need it anymore. Let's move into the future. But then it's a question of, um, of who makes those decisions, who has the right 
to decide what should intentionally and arbitrarily be removed, wiped or destroyed, uh, particularly when it comes to art. Because I still think uh, Little Britain and, and Chris Lilly are hilarious. And I, I, I'm the sort of person that the, is re-watching it and thinks it's even more hilarious now because I'm told that uh, in the case of Little Britain, even by the creators, I shouldn't enjoy it uh, anymore. And of course, uh, well, it's, it's commonly known as the Streisand uh, effect. If you're told not to or you can't uh, view something and the... The, the Amazon and DVD sales of uh, Little Britain and Gone with the Wind, though Gone with the Wind is is back on HBO Max uh, with a, a trigger warning. Uh, Faulty Towers, uh, the Germans episodes, that's uh, also uh, back after, or John Cleese uh, gave the uh, the BBC a, 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 a serve for taking it down, as you'd expect, uh, uh, no, no less. Um. I guess I can, from my own personal point of view, I can um, explain my thoughts on that whole issue. Um, I've done a lot of comedy in my life, and uh, I did, in fact, 11 years of um, trench warfare comedy at Witches and Riches Theatre Restaurant, which was all, um, in essence, you know, lowbrow humour of a sexual innuendo base. Um, then I went on and I ran my own cabaret club for a while. And we used to do burlesque, which when it came out in the 1950s was considered very risque. And so burlesque, for the people who don't know, was, an, was a, a form of striptease where the women would never remove everything. They would always have pasties and a covering down below. And it was still considered very risque, whereas now it's an art form. So we did burlesque and there were some um, uh, gay guys who did boylesque. And I started up Rolesque, <laughs> all bold and solid gold. So I did a couple of acts. Um, and one of those, I wore um, brown face because I was playing an Indian character who starts off in full Indian regalia and then strips off and does Bollywood burlesque. Um, it was very much the humour of the innocence, very much in the way that Peter Sellers uh, portrayed that kind of character in that film, The Party. And one of the saddest things for me, was because I was very good at making people laugh and the majority of the room just were in tears laughing and I could see some people sitting there wanting to laugh and just sort of looking around the room like, it, should, should I laugh at this? And I thought, bang, you've already been thought controlled. Right there. You want to laugh, but because of the um, restrictions that have been placed on you in our mm -hmm. society, you're not going to laugh. That there is thought control. That's everything that George Orwell wrote about, and it's wrong. Um, there was a bit of flurry of activity about me performing that character, and every now and then I, I put those pictures up there of me um, dressed in that character. And uh, people were sort of, oh, you shouldn't be doing this in cultural appropriation and rah, 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 rah. And I just uh, ended the arguments by saying, nothing and no one will stop me doing whatever I want to do on stage in the argument. And that applies to any art form. And I'll say it again, nothing and no one will stop me doing what I want to do when it comes to my art. And that is the approach we should take. Con conversely, I used to do a sort of a, a Texas show, cowboy character and have, you know, like to lift up here like that and wear a hat and strip off his clothes and have sheriff badges on his nipples. And, and that was okay. I wasn't culturally appropriating a Texan. Um, an American character because that character was presumably of, a, of the same skin colour as, as mine. But Indian or blackface, Justin Trudeau, anyone, uh, just in case you've forgotten, yes. um, somehow creates, creates waves and is a problem. It's garbage hmm. and it needs to be relegated straight away to where it belongs, which is that judgment and that um, unlawful censorship of what should be free expression. Obviously, the, the negative connotation of blackface, well, it goes back to the, the minstrel uh, shows in the United States in the late 19th century, which were deliberately designed to, to mock African Americans. But that is not the purpose of blackface overall. And in the, in the context of Chris Lilly and the Little Britain perform, performers, they're character actors and they play all the characters 
on their shows. And obviously they, they want to portray characters of other races and, and ethnicity. And obviously they're only one skin color. And so they obviously have to apply the, 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 the makeup and, and put on an accent. I, I mentioned nobody complains about uh, a woman face. Uh, I, I know that some of the, the, the radical feminists uh, in the past have uh, complained uh, about it, calling it a uh, woman face. But the, the purpose of it is to portray a, a character for humorous purposes and of course they play white characters as well i mean little britain for example uh vicky pollard the the no but yeah high schooler that of course mocks well what you'd call sort of the the, the lower class class uh, brits because what is it she has uh, uh six children to, to seven different men it's equal opportunity comedy well i think i've in my career i've dressed up um, more than most drag queens as a woman um, I could wear a set, set of size 13 high heels very well. Um, once you, you can see just the way you're describing the problems, how messy the whole situation is, how hypocritical. You can do this, but you're not allowed to do that. And then hang on, that's a bit of a grey area, and that person may not like that, but that one says it's okay. It's a mess. The whole point is the ability to be able to express and the main focus of all of these shows, even if you want to go back to, you know, um, some of the, the earlier UK comedians like the two Ronnies and Benny Hill, who's a classic example, their main focus was to make people laugh, to not to make people laugh at other people's expense, but to make people laugh. Historically, with blackface, um, I remember when I was a kid, we used to watch the Al Jolson story, which came on on uh, TV, and, and it was quite a sad story about the life of... Um, of, uh, of that character and, and what he went through in his trials and tribulations. But his, once again, the historical context of that was that his, his performance piece, his art, was based on that character. It wasn't in any way designed to destroy um, the, the feelings of people towards people um, with, uh, with darker skin. And I think the, what I'm getting at is, is what people need to realise is context. Every single thing needs to be placed within context. You can look at something that you watched when you were a kid, like the goodies, um, you know, back in the, in the 70s, and kind of say, oh, yeah, I, I, I remember we used to come home from school. I loved that. It was so funny. We used to laugh our heads off at all the crazy stuff. And then you look at it now when you're an adult, you say, look, it's not as funny anymore, but it, it has its place back in history back then. Um, as times change, um, of course, cultures and tastes change as well. But that doesn't mean that you suddenly need to erase everything that's come before you. It has to be placed in, concept, in context. And that should apply to every single aspect or endeavour of human history, whether it's political, military, um, the, uh, the, tr the transition of, of countries from, from one state to another whether they were supposedly taken over, invaded, uh, wars fought and lost, um, fortunes lost and won, all placed in context. And generally, the, the contexts are historical um, or from the point of, of, um, of art, uh, they, can be, they can be art, just pure art, um, or they can be entertainment or comedy. And once you just place them in that sort of context, then it's okay to keep them around. Um, you know, people look back at some of our, you know, some of our classics, uh, classic um, performers, classic films, uh, classic comedians, and, and they are regaled. You know, I remember they, um, they got uh, Spike Milligan up to accept a lifetime award from the BBC, and he was, a, you know, he was probably in his late 70s, and he, he just gave this comic um, response to his to the accepting of his awards that had the audience in tears and it just showed that even at his age and the lifetime of achievement that he he'd um, brought to us the gifts that he'd given to us that he was still relevant he made us laugh he made us feel good and um the people that that basically want to try and and quash that and erase that i don't care what they want to call themselves need to understand what context they're living in.
what context do they want to apply themselves to? Is it only their own narrow field? Or is it a wider context that we can all, you know, uh, take on board and accept? Well, there was the timely airing last night on Sky News, the death of the Aussie Larrikin, hosted by Outsiders uh, panelist uh, Rowan Dean, where they interviewed some of the oh, greatest uh, historical Aussie Larrikins, uh, Delvin Delaney, who who played a lot of the, the 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 bimbo sexy characters on the on the Paul Hogan show, which I haven't watched much of. I better go down and get the the DVDs of of that because I don't think it's ever going to be yeah, on yeah, <laughs> streaming yeah, services. Yeah, Yep. Uh, Vince Sorrenti, who uh, he's uh, been a, uh, I, it's a performer of uh, uh, WOG and and other politically incorrect humor, and of course uh, Paulie Fennick, who is well, he's still making uh, Fat Pizza and uh, how's those uh, episodes in in 2020 and they're just as as, as funny as as ever they've they've got all the the the, the type of uh, offensive out there their jokes and it's still bloody hilarious look i mean i, I think that the bottom line is if you want to laugh laugh if your natural feeling and emotion is to laugh at something laugh you know, you can, you can deal with the consequences of that later. So if there's a car crash and you're laughing at it, well, okay, people are going to be upset with you. But you cannot quell the human emotional response. Um, that's not the way we're built. Um, so, and people come from all different walks of life, all different experiences, and some people may laugh at things that others um, don't laugh at. Some people might find things tragic, whereas um, other people find them triumphant. The whole point is um, what I'm noticing is that a lot of what's happening in this uh, century is that uh, whoever it is, is trying to relegate humanity to one big homogenous mass, almost like a drone species that has to conform on so many levels. And the whole notion of being supposedly human, um, which which, you know, everyone, all the progressives say that we should be, you know, we should be free to express ourselves, we should be tolerant, we should be this, we should be that. Well, that flies in the face of the whole notion that they're trying to kind of squash everyone into this very narrow little basket. Um, and we're all individuals. And the whole point of being individuals is we're all different. And rather than say, you can be that kind of different, but you can't be this kind of different is just put, placing restriction on that very freedom and that independence and that individuality that we all are. Um, I don't want to get too Nietzsche with the whole notion, but it's just oppression. Uh, you know, I happen to believe that there are some very, very powerful forces that are, are doing the old textbook divide and conquer. Uh, so we've got this group against that, gays against straight, black against white, rich against poor, um, let, you know, it's just endless and it's working like a charm. We're all, we're all falling victim to this divide and conquer, men against women. You know, we should, we kind of need each other, guys. And um, yeah, I'm going to use a, a, a labelist term. It sounds like you're describing communists. Well, interestingly enough, um, and I, I will read it out because I came across this little tidbit um, which I thought was very salient to what we're talking about. It won't take long. Um, where are we? Okay, here we go. So I want you to listen to this very carefully. We must realize that our party's most powerful weapon is racial tension by propounding into the consciousness of the dark races that for centuries they have been oppressed by the whites we can mold them to the program of the Communist Party. In America, we will aim for subtle victory. Whilst inflaming the Negro minority against the whites, we will endeavor to instill in the whites a guilt complex for their exploitation of the Negroes. We will aid the Negroes to rise in prominence in every walk of life, in the professions and in the world of sports and entertainment. With this prestige, the Negro will be able to intermarry with the whites and begin a process which will del deliver America to our cause. That was written by Israel Cohen in 1912, a racial plan for the 20th century. 
So uh, there are that, along with that and many other aspects of the classic communist manifesto, if, if anyone wants to bother to read it, uh, you'll see that uh, we're following a textbook, you know, including things like disarming the civilian population, creating division between um, the groups, um, creating a whole plethora of minority activist groups that are really operating under one umbrella, but using them to destabilise the current um, democratic system. All of this is, is classic communist textbook um, uh, procedure for dismantling Western culture. Now, whether you want to call yourself a socialist or, or a communist and whether you agree with that philosophy is irrelevant. The whole point is that somebody is pushing that agenda and uh, it's behind what is supposedly... Um, uh, we should really be at the apex of the 21st century. Here we are, 2020, shining pinnacle of, um, of human achievement and we're going backwards. I, I, I am appalled at, at where we've gone as a species. It, it, we've gone, we're eating each other alive mm. and we're susceptible to, the, to some of the most insidious forces and falling victim to the, to the same old place, playground um, um, prejudices and, and, and just manipulations. It's, it's very sad, it's very uh, dispiriting. And I'm a writer, I write books as well as make films and, and act and so on. And I'm writing some books that are, um, I guess, exploring this this current state it's a very dystopian state and it doesn't bode well for our future as a species what did they used to uh, think 50 years ago that uh, there'd be flying saucers uh, uh, in the air and that we'd be living on uh, space stations uh, on the on the moon uh, we do have a a lot more uh, advanced technology in in 2020, uh, but uh, the, the the same human conflicts uh, remain. Uh, uh, humanity certainly hasn't got to uh, those grand heights that uh, those 50 years ago thought might be possible. When oh, we just landed, uh, uh, humans had just landed on the the moon. Now talked about how Gone with the Wind. Uh, is back, uh, but with a, a trigger warning. And this is what, uh, when Disney Plus, uh, their streaming service, launched last year, some of their historical movies, such as, as Dumbo, which was made in, in 1940 when they had the, the, G, the, the Jim Crows, uh, the, the, those black uh, crow, or they, they spoke with, with black uh, voices, those, those crows, which obviously a, is, a, is a reference to Jim Crow uh, segregation laws and I, I just want to play uh, now we're, we're, we've talked about uh, offensive uh, comedy the the late Joan Rivers that uh, uh, I incredibly savage uh, comedian uh, she'd be rolling in her grave now at the political correctness in in 2020 I just want to play the 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 trigger warning she put uh, in front of her uh, st uh, stand-up routine Lastly, Ms. Rivers has asked me to mention that if during the performance she says anything that might offend any individuals, families, organizations, races, creeds, religious groups, states, countries, or planets, please know that from the bottom of her heart, Ms. Rivers would like to say that Just lighten the fuck up! These are just jokes, you assholes! Okay, let's do the show! And she was exactly right that... Everyone uh, now takes jokes personally. That they're 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 a personal attack on on somebody. And going going back to the the the, the death of the Aussie larrikin that was on Sky News last night. That uh, taking the Mickey, taking a, a check on yourself. It wasn't meant to be malicious. It's like don't take yourself. Uh, too too seriously. Don't get so uh, stuck up if you can't laugh at yourself. Well, to to quote our, um, you know, our classic Australian larrikin character that's been sent up by um, uh, a comedian, Chopper Reed. Harden the fuck up. Um, look, I guess the thing is, I often find that when people are trying to reason with the assault on on culture. They find themselves backpedaling and trying to rationalize. Now, look, it's okay because the reason that joke is said this because of the, don't even go there. 
um, the whole point is you need to, I believe, I, I don't like bullies and um, I see a lot of bullies and bullies need to be stood up to. So you shouldn't even need to rationalise something as simple as saying, guys, get over it, have a laugh, it's all cool. Um, you know, I remember there was a classic case where um, Ronald Reagan was on microphone and he thought the mics had been turned off and he, he leaned forward into the mic and went, uh, the planes are on their way, we begin bombing in five minutes. And, you know, Russia went on red alert and there was outrage and rah, 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 and, and it's like, for God's sake, it's a joke. Um, jokes are just the common denominator to unify all of us. Um, and one of the things I look around in, um, I, I mentioned to you earlier that um, I've drawn back from social media because social media is just an evil, in all guises, is an evil platform to um, basically emphasise this kind of division and to get us um, mired in, in a cultural war. So I've sort of pulled back from it. And I put a post up there uh, because I listened to an old song from Kate Bush called The Man with the Child in His Arms, which is a beautiful song, just a, a magnificent musical composition and her performance and a beautiful song. And I just put it up there and said, we've forgotten beauty, here's a reminder. And we have forgotten beauty. I look around me and I see ugliness. I see ugly, just not people, the way they look, I see the way they behave. Everyone is, you know, or as good old Joker says, why so serious? You know, why did, how did we get so serious? Why is it that you literally cannot do anything? And, and our, our youth, which should be brimming with, um, with the, uh, the oyster, you know, of life, the, the pearl in the oyster of life, brimming with enthusiasm, um, uh, an outlook over the horizon, a walking around like grim death with faces pinched and tight, ready to rip you to pieces, um, with a cause behind every word and uh, a vitriol behind, behind every debate. Why are people so angry? I mean, I can understand that people feel misrepresented, uh, misrepresented or disenfranchised or even treated badly. Um, you know, if you look at every single person's life, we all know that um, we've all gone through hell in our own ways. Everybody gets, uh, you know, gets on the conveyor belt of crap that comes through life and then extracts their little gold nuggets where they can. But for some reason, it's become a political and cultural cause, you know. Um, so that's where all this... Um, basically get over it and harden up comes from is that you know when you see photos recently from the you know um the um commemoration of like the d-day landings at normandy and you see 17 and 18 year old kids on boats about to go into war and most of them just got blown into chunks of meat um and then you, you talk about oh we've got covid virus oh my god we're locked down we can't do anything and then you just go you don't know what adversity is you know, um, I talked to my, my grandparents about going through the Great Depression and World War II. Um, I talked to my uh, partner's um, parents about how they were in Germany under the Dresden firebombing and they just got cooked. And we just walk around like our lives are this, this grim destruction and, and, and injustice. You've never had it so good. And um, maybe that just sounds like some far out old rhetoric from an old man, but it's not. I didn't live through those times. But like all of us, I've, I've shared my pain. I'm just, in my opinion, I'm just a lot tougher than, than what I see around me. Uh, you're right about uh, social media that has, uh, it, as it's called, the, uh, the social media pilot on if somebody makes a politically incorrect joke or, or statement, the... The, the mob go, goes after them, and going back to last night's show, they, they chronologue the, the final years of Bill Leake's uh, life, where he was hounded for his uh, cartoons, and uh, when uh, he, he died suddenly at the age of 62, uh, the people on Twitter uh, were celebrating. And I can't believe that uh, these people on Twitter, they, they, their response to uh, campaigns a bit against political correctness is political correctness just uh, means being polite uh, to people. The people who 
say that, oh, that that's all political pr correctness is, are some of the nastiest people you you will ever encounter. They, Of course, they preach love and peace, uh, but uh, if you don't agree with them, they will viciously go after you. That's the paradox of it. Well, of course, I mean, um, you know, I guess uh, Antifa, which seems to be the, the militant arm of, of the progressives, and I hate judging, but I, I guess I'm just going to put it out there. Uh, they seem to be following in the footsteps of, um, of jackboot politics of the Nazis, whereas they will decry anything as being a na Nazism. Yet they're dressed in black, you know, hiding their faces and, you know, with, with a flag that's red and black and white, a very striking uh, kind of symbology. And then they're, um, you know, they're uh, attacking people. Uh, and beating people and pepper spraying people and, and creating a lot of violence and unrest. And you go, take a closer look at the brown shirts and, and, and tell me what is really the difference. Um, I don't also support um, the extreme right as well. Once again, the division is created and brought out the extremes in, in, in all of us. So the whole point is, um, if, you, if you want the kind of utopia the world that you want to live in, where you feel that it's tolerant and accepting, then um, you've got to try and resist forcing a lifestyle choice on anyone, because then all you're doing is doing um, what you, you're basically being a hypocrite. You're doing what you're saying uh, uh, people shouldn't do. I mean, I've, I've said this very um, on a number of occasions that I wish I could put my arms around the whole world and give it a nice big hug. But I can't. There's the way the world should be and there's the way the world is. There is division. There is injustice. There is imbalance. There are evil, evil people that could care less about freedom and um, freedom of expression and individuality who would crush us, under uh, crush, crush all mankind under a boot for a profit. Uh, that's the reality of the human species. It's a flawed species, but there is there is much virtue to us as well. The if I can give any advice, and I hate giving advice, is everybody needs to stop, take a breath, and stop fighting each other, and basically just say, build. You can't change the entire world, but you can build your own little world around you, and just try and live by those values, and and try and. Um, accept everybody else as best you can. Uh, I know that sounds perhaps contrite, but it's just, uh, I, I don't see where all this division is going to end. Um, we can see what's happening in the, in the United States, which is a very, may have started off as a legitimate process, uh, protest, but has now been exploited to, to um, lead to the imposition of a, of a, a socialist coup um, and a destruction of, of um, of American ideals and culture, and it's violent and it's ugly and it's uh, you know th there are blacks being killed by blacks now and there are innocents um, who are having their property destroyed and, and murders and assaults and you just think uh, somehow or rather the message has been lost. Um, it's not a question of shoot the messenger now; it's a question of blow the hell out of everything around it. Um, and I don't see that's going to achieve anything at all. I don't want to paint a grim picture. Um, I just think that. Um, we're not evolving. We're going backwards. The species needs to evolve um, and we need to just really find something within ourselves that brings us back to, to the fundamental nature of, of who we are as people. Well, you can't hug the, the world at the moment because that would breach uh, coronavirus uh, social <laughs> distancing. Uh, so there's that, uh, that restriction as well. The, the reason why comedy is so important is because it is, it is probably the the most important bastion of uh, free speech and the the next generation of uh, comedians that we have here in Australia uh, generation wine uh, they should be called uh, what is it? there there's Hannah Gatsby who won an, an Emmy for her Nanette special which I didn't really think was that uh, funny. There's that uh, Demi Lardner on ABC comedy with her dad's Google history uh, monologue. But we've seen this week uh, Josh Thomas, uh, uh, who created that uh, TV show, Please 
like me. Uh, he's a, a blonde, uh, white uh, person, even though he is uh, gay. Uh, he's decided to launch a campaign to rename Coon Cheese. Uh, because uh, of the the the, the racial uh, connotation to it, even though it was named after the the cheese processing creator uh, Edward uh, William Kuhn and uh, Michelle Laurie, uh, she's that uh, big uh, fat uh, short haired lady on the the project which you've been on, which we'll get to in a moment. Uh, she has claimed that she didn't write this social media post on Facebook, she was hacked uh, when she defended blackface in Australia. Uh, blackface in American culture has a different context that reaches far further back than it does in Australia, frankly, and this will be unpopular. It is true. Blackface has no cultural relevance in Australia. The minstrel history of blackface is largely unknown in Australia. There are golly, gollywog dolls uh, for sale in Australia, I've got a Gollywog uh, doll. Uh, I'm not ashamed to admit that. It was knitted uh, for me when I was born by my late uh, great aunt. Uh, I treasure that because it reminds me of her. Nobody can take that away from me. I'll continue on with uh, what uh, Michelle Laurie said. Please do, uh, don't do think you understand the nuance of Australian racism or that we understand yours. She's claimed that uh, she was she was uh, Facebook hacked and uh, uh, there's an investigation uh, uh, going on about how somebody uh, posted that under her name. And in past uh, past history shows that that when somebody claims they were hacked, uh, it's it, 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 it is basically a form of uh, trying to cover up what they what they did. I'm not implying that about Michelle Laurie, but that's sort of the historical context uh, about it. But those are the current crop of comedians in Australia. Look, I guess once again, I don't want to um, judge. And I certainly don't want to call them the left-wing social justice warrior comedians. The whole point is, if you laugh, great. You laugh. Um, I've always, as an artist, I've always felt that art and politics are uneasy bedfellows. That doesn't mean, or bed people, if you want to use the correct uh, non clementure of the time. Um, uh, it's, if you, you can do it, and sometimes there's a reason to be um, a little more political or or, or, or provide a different form of, of comedic expression that isn't self-deprecating um, or um, uh, or you know comedy of the in of, of the visual innocence like Mr Bean. Um, so there are different streams of comedy. The whole point is, by all means, um, there is, I guess if you want to call it politically correct comedians, absolutely. I've seen them. I go to the Comics Lounge quite a bit in North Melbourne and they have all different varieties of comedian comedians on. And the whole point is I laugh at what I laugh at and I don't laugh at what I don't find funny. Um, but everyone should have the opportunity to do that. Um, if, if, the current, if the current culture of youth primarily um, is going down a path where, where they're finding that more acceptable and that's part of, of their culture, that's 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 a decision that everyone can make. I don't really have a problem with that. Um, as long as I laugh, um, I just find there's a lot of stuff now that makes me go, you know, um, I just don't want to laugh. I want to burst out, out laughing, be in stitches. That's what good comedy is. And then when I think about that joke, uh, from the show last night, just burst out into to random laughter. That's memorable humor that I can just think and like, yeah, that was hilarious. I'm still laughing at it now. Well, what do I say? Um, time, time plus tragedy equals comedy. And I remember when I was at witches and britches and it was probably about maybe five weeks after 9-11 and I came out and did a dance sketch uh, dressed as Osama bin Laden uh, doing Eminem. And the first time I went out on stage, it was like, you could feel the audience like, and it was almost like, too soon. Um, and then literally probably about a month later, people were in stitches. So once again, it's context. Um, once you accept something as being funny, um, within yourself, you can't help it. You just start to laugh. I mean, look, I think I personally like to think that as far as I'm concerned, you laugh, laugh. Don't let anyone stop you from laughing, crying, or even, yeah, I guess expressing yourself and being angry if you have to. Um, 
But what we've all got to try and do is at least be aware that um, other people may not feel the same way. Uh, what we what we shouldn't do is just try and squash that. Right. That ain't going to work. Right. I mean, I'll, if I see something funny, I'm going to laugh at it. Um, if something makes me angry, I guess I'll get angry. Uh, I guess that makes me human. If you if you don't the the old saying if you don't like something that you see on TV, uh, just change the channel. Well, I guess it's, it is appropriate to a certain extent. I mean, we're, we were talking about trigger warnings. Um, trigger warnings to me are, are, I think they're a little superfluous, but, you know, really. Um, as far as I'm concerned, if, you, if you, you turn something on, you don't like it, or you come across something you don't like it, walk away or turn it off. Um, but you shouldn't need a trigger warning. Um, trigger warning. Trigger warnings can be applied to any traumatic event that you experience in your life. You're driving on the road and you have a horrendous car accident, as, as I've had on about three occasions. I didn't need a trigger warning to say, oh, my God, that was horrible. Um, I just dealt with it. Um, so life life is one big trigger warning, guys. Um, so all I can say is you don't need a trigger warning. You just need to be able to deal with whatever it is that has upset you or distressed you. Uh, you you're your own power. Um, and one thing that I, that I miss which I must admit I find in, in people of, of my generation is um, is the steel. People have no steel in them anymore, no resilience, no um, no strength, no inner strength. Um, I've been in a, a lot of a situations where I've just sat back and ex observed uh, young people um, in large groups and even people that I've met. and. It, it seems like a bit of a generalisation, but they're they're like frightened little flowers. It's 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 very sad. They almost can't look you in the eye. I mean, I'm very steadfast, very forthright about the way I communicate, and I talk to them. I'm right. I'm doing this. I'm writing this book, and I'm making these films, and uh, and I've got this passion and energy, and they're they're looking at me like like they don't even want to look at me like I'm frightening, and I've almost got to try and stop from from overpowering them with my energy and my passion. And uh, I don't know what we did, but we, we took our youth and we crushed it into into a grey wilted stem. NPCs um, is the the, the 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 popular term, non-player characters. Yeah, because... I've seen those little little um, characters. Look, uh, you know, guilty as charged. Um, the previous generations, we have not given a vision for our youth. Uh, we have we have given them a, a, a nihilistic sense of life. Where they've got too much knowledge, too much technology, um, no hope, and they they just kind of are lost, and they feel overburdened by by some of the um, heinous stresses of, of the modern life. And uh, we haven't given them some kind of old future. I remember when I you know I, I left uh, school and I went and did university, um, and I took my snap, you know, my graduation photo, and there I was looking out, you know over the horizon, you know, life for me had, had um, hope, had um, anticipation and energy and, and, and dreams of what I was able to achieve. I don't see a lot of that now. I see, I see a lot of youth just uh, either angry, lost, and, and they don't have the strength to be able to stand up and be who they are without attaching some cause to it. And maybe I'm wrong in that regards, but I don't, I just don't see that. Um, and that's what saddens me the most. I've got children, and uh, they're entering their teens, and and uh, the kind of world that they're um, that we're handballing over to them. It's now up to them to to take this civil. Oh, lost you for a moment there. Oh, lost you for a moment there, Paul. Yeah, it sort of went a bit. Uh, maybe, maybe uh, one of the Google powers that be is kind of <laughs> poking their head in, and going, "Hmm, not sure. I like where this one's going." Quick, hit protocol sixty-three. Well, you gotta laugh at it all, man. You gotta yeah. laugh. I, I do laugh a lot because otherwise you cry. Um, I, I certainly know pain, and um, I've I've been an artist my entire life. Um, I've done a lot. And I feel like I'm just starting out. I'm 54 and I've got a long way to go. I've got movies, books, films, uh, creative expression, acting, comedy, songs I'm doing. 
that's my my salvation. It's my panacea. Um, it's my battleground. So that's where I'll be a warrior. Um, but just don't get in the way of that. Don't get in the way of my art. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, art is for me is tantamount. Uh, you do whatever you want to do. You want to go up and blow up some building? Well, by all means, go and do that. No, don't do that. Um, do not come to my front door with that, or you will go out feet first. Um, I'm a very capable man as well. I'm a very dangerous man, actually. Um, <laughs> it's starting to get quite uh, uh, dark and nihilistic now. Well, I won't say much about it. All I'll say is when the world is at peace, a gentleman keeps his sword by his side. Sun Tzu, the art of war. Well, humanity has, has always bounced back from from dark times. There are always these uh, uh, dips. Now, uh, I've been talking about these these streaming services, which have been well uh, wiping uh, a lot of their content, politically incorrect content, this past week. They had been gaining a lot of traffic uh, with the, the coronavirus lockdown and, and stay at home orders because uh, what else can you do? Uh, at your home and there's almost all of the world's uh, films uh, at your fingertips for $15 uh, a a month. Uh, But uh, obviously, uh, and I've uh, talked about this, uh, there there was uh, a spike in sales of Little Britain and Gone with the Wind DVDs. I've I've sort of speculated that there might be a a second wave of panic buying, but this time at the JB Hi-Fi DVD uh, section getting all the politically incorrect uh, shows and and films uh, before they completely uh, taken off the the shelves. Uh, I sort of see that they the, the, because it seemed unstoppable the move to to streaming. Uh, people were were not buying or ditching their their DVD uh, collections. But now I'm not so sure. I don't think they'll be able to stop it um, for the same reason that when. Um the uh, um, video was released by um, by the Christchurch shooter um, and streamed online, and uh, the the internet forces went went into overdrive to to strip and remove every single aspect of that. But as you know, there are people that are very quick and very clever enough to grab that stuff, place it into another forum where it can be retrieved at a later date. Um, and the same goes with movies. I mean, movies exist once they're in the in the in the cloud or in cyberspace then they're there forever so they can pull them all off the shelves by all means and they can restrict sales of of, through you know public forums like jb hi-fi but uh ultimately the truth will out and ultimately art will out and i think i think it's good if people are going to go you know what i don't want little brit to disappear so i'm going to whatever happens i'll keep my copy and then down the track i'll just post it online in whatever new online forum there will be fantastic um let's go back to you know ray bradbury's fahrenheit 451 which i recommend everyone go and read before you start pulling down statues and um renaming things because it's the philosophy is is quite quite evident in that film it's you know there's a place and you should not destroy it and it will never be destroyed um because people will always especially with technology will be able to resurrect it um, and it's it's a, it's a path to to a black a black future once we do that. So yeah, I, I guess there are people that are that are going to preserve history um, with the statues. By all means, um, I, I think we need to guard them. I, I think they need to be protected. If somebody pulls one down and destroys it, build it again. Um, you know, there, there are people in history that that we just sort of abhor and we say, oh God, you know. But do we really want to forget? the good guys and the bad guys or do we want to use history to remind us um you know if you want to take the poster boy of the 20th century of evil adolf hitler you know should we just remove all trace of him so that we forget well uh, uh, they want to remove churchill now as well Never. There was some Instagram influencer who went on, was at Good Morning Britain and said World War Two is too triggering for people to learn about. So uh, let's uh, let's not uh, t- uh, teach any of it. I-, I guess that Instagram influencer wants uh, uh, the-, the next generation to or deny all of World War Two, including the Holocaust. Well, you know, 
when you think about those historical um, um, characters of, of that era, particularly World War Two, you know, there's a lot of America bashing going on, and you know, sort of um, crying out against uh, the, the obvious patriotism and, and nationalism of, of the American um, nation. You know, they kind of forget that uh, it delivered us from World War Two from our enemies um, on two fronts. So there were, you know, there was a lot of historical relevance to the fact that had not been for the Americans, well, we might have been under a different rule. Um, so it's a case of how quickly people forget. Winston Churchill was a great leader. There was a lot. Look, there's a there's skullduggery behind all of those great leaders and, and nations. You know, you know, we all know it. You, know, you should be um, canny enough to know that there's a lot of backroom deals going on between so-called adversaries and, and adversaries and, and allies and, and enemies. You know, I mean, that's that's once again part and parcel with human nature. But um, you can learn great things from, from, from great people and even great bad people. Um, so I don't know what the achievement would be to say, let's pull down the statue of Winston Churchill. You go, okay, so what have you achieved exactly? Nothing, really. Um, his legacy is embedded in, in human, in the human uh, historical chronicles, and so it should be, as should uh, a lot of people. I guess if you also apply that to the current um, trend, you can say, all right, let's say, for instance, that the, the, the movement whereby Antifa has taken over Seattle and created the autonomous zone, Chaz. And they may, uh, they may create a leader that will rise from that and he might do something, or he or she, and there might be this historical document. So I guess in the future, should we not pull that down if we don't like it too? So that's forgotten in history. Is it only the relevance and importance of history, what you want to create, yeah. what you deem to be viable and relevant? And in history, in you know, 10 years from now, people might look back on that and they will look back on all these events and go, they'll have a very different perspective to what we have. In the same way that we look back at 9-11 now and we all have a very different perspective on 9-11 than we did at the time. So in context, you cannot choose who are to be our figureheads of history. They, they are chosen for you. They, they do what they do and they create history. Um, you know, you shouldn't cheapen their legacy by attacking a symbol of theirs because you don't like it. We'll finish off now by talking about uh, your uh, latest uh, film project, which I mentioned in the, the introduction, uh, Wasp, the, the Port Arthur uh, Massacre. And obviously it's it's hard anywhere in the world to, to finance uh, films, uh, but uh, it's it's much better if you get a, a government grant from uh, Screen Australia or the, uh, the ABC. Are uh, you confident that you can get one to, to make this movie? I don't, I don't really believe in government grants. Um, you know, I mean, we can talk about the, the Australian film industry or the failings of the Australian film industry uh, ad infinitum. I think one of the, the salient problems we have is that we are, in essence, uh, a government grant funded industry for the, for the majority. Um, so to give you some idea, in 2018 to 19, Screen Australia um, invested uh, nearly $1.2 billion in, in drama production. Uh, so something like 33% of that were feature length films. And uh, that was a 53% rise on investment from the previous years. Um, but I guess you could sort of argue and say, well, that's pretty substantial. Where is our industry? And I'm talking pre-COVID. And where is the return? Where is the financial monetary return from, from this investment? And, and there will, there will, you know, it, look, we don't really have to, to go into detail, but the bottom line is that generally speaking, for, for a number of reasons, a lot of Australian films that are supported by the government sector, they, they don't make money. Um, they don't do what films generally do, which is, or should do, which is to reach a global market and return enough financial remuneration so that uh, the filmmakers, filmmakers can then go on and make another film independently of the government. You know, we shouldn't really be a, um, a teat fed uh, industry. We should be self-supporting. I like to say that it's show business, not show show. So the whole point is, 
you need to be able to make a film that's going to be able to sell. And to give you one example of that, I like to use when that little movie Saw, the horror film Saw by James Wan and Lee Winnell. Uh, they, they shopped it around Australia and they said, oh, no, 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 it's a little horror film, go away. And they eventually took it to the States and made it there for a low budget, you know, about a million dollars, had Danny Glover for four days, uh, so and so. That film made more money in its opening weekend than the last 10 years of Australian films. So you look at that and you go, hmm, are we not getting something right in the, in the mix here from the governments? Um, so by all means, you know, we should explore our culture. I personally think that there is a current obsession with Indigenous culture um, and gender, um, gender issues. I don't have a problem with the fact that we need to explore that as part of art and culture, but it's a question of balance. And also, if you're going to be um, creating an industry where you need to employ people, bring money back to the equation, put us on the map internationally as a, you know, a cinematic um, uh, entity unto our own right, then you, you have a, a responsibility to, to also continue a, a fiscal return to enable that to grow, expand, and to give voice to more and more filmmakers, more and more stories, and, and different streams of entertainment. And we, we just don't do that. Um, and I think that's one of the biggest problems is, uh, you know, we're, we're basically uh, hobbling ourselves by our adherence to, to cultural um, doctrines. Well, we mentioned the the Paul Hogan show before, uh, Crocodile Dundee, one of the, his uh, movie, one of the most iconic uh, Australian movies, uh, international of all time, same with, with Mad Max as well. You can't think of many Australian movies in the past, uh, well, in the 21st century that have really uh, made it big. And as is the, the case uh, with a lot of uh, government-supported uh, industries, uh, government just makes it worse. Look, I think um, look, the proof is in the pudding. Uh, you can make an independent film, you can make a multi-million dollar film as they did with uh, Danger Close which uh, had all the ingredients purportedly to return a profit. Unfortunately, it didn't. It flopped very, very badly. Um, I think uh, ultimately a film will stand or fall on its own merits and it will find an audience if it's good enough to do that, or a TV show. Uh, my own personal belief is that we're about 20 years behind the sophistication of the writing in other nations like the UK and the US. Um, you know, I was... You know, I don't like to judge, but, you know, I saw there was an ad for, you know, um, Halifax, you know, um, FD or whatever it is, um, rebooted. And I just thought, really, again? Like, are we still sort of in that era of, of producing television that hasn't gone to the likes of Mad Men or Breaking Bad or, you know, um, any number of shows that are so popular? on the streaming platforms that they make millions and they lead on to careers and, and other other productions. We're sort of churning out the same old tired stuff and sort of going, have a look at our wonderful Australian outback and um, our quirky little back, backyard Australian characters and that'll do it. It won't do it. Your market is always a global market and it's got to appeal on that level. Um, on a simplistic level, genre films generally do a lot better um, because people, they go to, to, um, they go to the movies to escape from reality. They want, they want larger than life. They want excitement, horror, fear, action, anger, laughter. Um, there, I have to say, there was a very interesting um, psychological comparison of movie titles. And they were talking about how movie titles are very, very important to capture an audience at the box office. So to give you an idea, America might have War of the Worlds, Armageddon, you know, these huge kind of things. And then you go to some of the Australian titles and it's like, Three dollars, the oyster farmer. Oh, that was a shocking, uh, Peaches. boring movie. That and three dollars. Uh, you're not really kind of grabbing me by by the short and curlies there. You, you know, the notion of, of a film called three dollars is that you're going to go to the cinema and get a film that's worth three dollars. Um, and as oh, a result, the ticket it, was more for, more than three dollars for that. Well, yeah, it, it only made about eight hundred dollars worldwide. <laughs> Uh, sorry, $800,000 world, worldwide. So, you know, I think, you know, the problem is that um, a government-funded 
film industry in itself is self-restricting. Um, and some of our biggest successes, as we know, which have admittedly been sort of big co-productions like Prophet Old Dundee, they've reached outside that little colloquial, culturally sanctioned and supported area and made films that everybody wants to go and see. And, you know, there are other films that do that, films like The Full Monty, which was a, you know, a little movie made in the UK. It wasn't a huge budget, and it just blitzed the Academy Awards and da-da-da. So you can do it, um, and some of our films do do it. You know, films like Lantana, The Babadook, um, you know, which basically took 10 million worldwide. That was an Australian horror film. Um, I believe it was American Accent. Uh, Lantana wasn't too bad for a, a Australian art house movie. Yeah, look, uh, uh, there are some great Australian movies, and and we certainly had a had a we had a, a real voice and a visionary um, individuality back in, in sort of the seventies with films like Wake in Fright, or Shame, um, you know, just films that that just sort of they didn't try to uh, to soften the blow or to try and 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 appease some kind of government entity. They just went, we want to make this kind of gutsy Aussie movie that's about this, that, this, and that. And they were an entity unto their own right. And since then, uh, it's all been kind of smothered in, in this kind of politically correct, bureaucratic bureaucratic government mess that just makes you makes films that you go, look, yeah, great, but I, I really don't want to see that. Mm. I'm not going to pay my money to see that. And the cinema chains, um, you know, they know too. The reason they don't support us at, at, at what should be a crucial box office, which is the local domestic box office, they know that the films won't make money. So they go, oh, we'll sort of limp you out and give you, if you're lucky, a little two-week cinematic release in the downtimes. You know, they're, they're dictated to by the by the big Hollywood boys. So, that, you know, they're going to show... Um, you know, the next Avengers movie or Thor or something like that. And they're all slotted in years in advance. And Australian films are lucky, lucky if they get a cinematic release. So they don't even get a chance to kind of go, ta-da. But more than that, they have to be films that go, ta-da, to then get people to go and pay their money. And, you know, there have been films like that that people went, oh, my God, you've got to go and see Chopper. Well, you've got to go and see um, Priscilla, Queen of the yeah. Desert. Or... Kenny uh, was a, a Australian film in the, the 21st century, an Australian one. That was the, the, the talk of the nation for a while, made uh, Shane Jacobson into oh, a domestic uh, household name. He's been in so much since. Yeah, look, it's great. I love to see that. I know, I know Shane because I went to film school with him years ago and his brother Clayton. Um, and it's just fantastic to see that. We need to, even uh, some of our local projects um, like uh, Joel Edgerton, you know, I mean, he's kicking major goals. And even Jackie Weaver, you know, from her early days in TV, she's now an A-list Hollywood star. And, and it doesn't mean you have to go to Hollywood to kind of, what it means is you just need to be a commodity that can be uh, sold as well as being culturally relevant and just globally relevant. Um, so, Wasp the Port Arthur Massacre, to go back to that, I've been um, working on that now for about five years. I've researched it very, very heavily. And it's a black film um, by the nature of its content. And, yeah, it's, it's very political. Um, it's, it's hard enough to raise money for any films, but that film particularly is like, Whoa, leave it alone, don't touch it. It's, uh, but I will make it. Um, and I've already figured out a way to do it on a lower budget if I have to. Um, but it's 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 a, a worthy piece of of our Australian history. You know, it's a part, a major part of our Australian history. And uh, despite what my detractors say, I think it needs a voice, and it needs to be examined in the cold, hard light of day. So I'll make that film. Um, I've got to do a horror film this year, and then we may be doing an action film the year after, and then that may hope um, help to finance or put me on the map to then do the Port Arthur Massacre. I hope to do it within at least two to three years. Well, our senior producer, Morgan Munro, he uh, did a feature for The Unshackled on uh, Wasp, uh, the Port Arthur Massacre. Uh, but uh, you also got a, a feature uh, on, the, on the project as, as well. And uh, Waleed, or well, this is according to The, the Age, uh, slammed uh, uh, you for stoking conspiracy theories. There's uh, Waleed's, uh, what, what is that sort of shocked, uh, baffled face? 
and and there's uh, you there. You've got a bit less a bit less hair there. He's got some well, needs uh, uh, some uh, what is it, a plant on his uh, on his suit there. Uh, but uh, what was that uh, like for you? Was it live or was it uh, pre-recorded? And they they did the snipping oh, and cutting with poor you. Poor old Waleed. I mean. You know, he's the poster boy for political correctness and multiculturalism. And, uh, look, he's, he's running with his product. Um, uh, he, makes, he makes good money um, and he sells a product like anyone else does. And his product is, is to create that kind of sanctioned controversy um, whilst sh shying away from the real issues. Um, and, look, you know, I think I went on to the project. I was in L.A. at the time uh, trying to raise money for the film. And uh, I made the decision to release the announcement of the film just prior to the anniversary of the massacre on the 28th of April. And I, I was a bit nervous about doing that because I'm um, contrary to popular belief, I'm very respectful to the victims and the survivors and the first responders and the police and the people that have suffered as a result of Port Arthur. So I had to make a decision about whether I would make that announcement or not. Once I did, the press exploded on it. And I did quite a few interviews, radio interviews and press. Most of them were supportive, um, but I know the project and I, I knew what they would do. Uh, so I, I got online beforehand and said, okay, I've done this interview, uh, they're gonna butcher it, let's see what they do to it. And sure enough, that's exactly what they did. They cut a 14 minute interview down to one and a half minutes. <laughs> and uh, they did so because I, I ripped them to pieces. Um, and it was very satisfying, actually, because they knew they didn't have anything at the end of the interview. And I, I saw their faces on the other end of the screen. And they were crestfallen. And they were like, and I was like, did you like that? You know, um, so they had to butcher it and, and do what they did. Uh, and he got a lot of flack for it. Um, their site got inundated. They eventually had to pull the interview down. They just got attacked. Have you but still that's got a copy, Ali, for, uh, copy of it? Was. Say again? Have you still got a copy of it? I have the uh, written transcript of the full interview. Um, yeah. Now, I should have probably filmed myself doing the, the interview so I had that and then I would have just put it online. But I just sort of felt, look, I'm a little more media savvy than most people think. It's the oldest trick in the book. You get the two sides warring against each other and everybody talks about your endeavour. Um, so I kind of used them in the same way that he used me. Um, I think I really upset him once because I... I described him as one of the the legion of bleach teeth infomercial salesmen masquerading as journalists. Oh. Um, so, look, you know, how dare the media you. is a double edged sword. You know, they serve a purpose, and you can use them, but you've got to be careful because they'll cut you to ribbons. They've got an agenda to follow, like anyone. You know, I remember, you know, Wally was going on about the the whole gang crisis thing and saying, "Oh, I don't know what." What uh, Malcolm Turnbull at the time knows that I don't, but I don't see any evidence of these black gang crimes out there on the streets. He lives in Richmond. Like, of course not, because he lives in a $2.1 million mansion in, in inner city upmarket Richmond. You know, he would never set foot in places like Tarnit and Broad Meadows and Werribee, where I've worked as a frontline security guard. And over the years, I've seen, I've seen the streets. Um, but, you know, people like Waleed make, like it's all a popularity contest. They get the, the gold Loki and they get a lot of money and they get paid well. Most of our media spokesmen, um, you know, they, they get paid good money just to get up there and, and, and spout off. And people often forget that they go, oh, we're all in this together. And it's like, no, no, we're not. You've got plenty of money. You're still employed. You're living in luxury, most most likely. You know, you're, you're considered a, a stalwart member of society. You go on from one job to another. You know, they, they don't know generally what a lot of adversity is, is about. Perhaps I'm judging it once again, but it's, it's hard to sort of feel, you know, feel the, the pain of the street when you live in some mansion, you know. Yeah. You know, getting paid however many hundred thousand a year. Uh, there's my little rant anyway. Oh, well, it's been great to oh, finally meet and, and chat with you, Paul. Good, uh, good luck with all of your uh, future uh, film projects. Uh, I'm st I'm starting to to see that uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, dissident uh, Australian uh, filmmakers uh, through, or well, Morgan uh, introducing me to Richard, and then introducing uh, 
me to to you i noticed that richard was in the chat uh earlier that uh, there's quite well that's why he's called uh, he calls his festival melbourne underground film festival there's there, there's a whole whole lot of uh based uh filmmakers uh, that uh, if they only had a, had a bit more uh backing uh, uh australian film industry uh could be much more uh special than it currently is well, I guess, yeah, we'll keep trying. Um, all I can say is just do whatever you want to do and, and, and don't wait around to be funded and don't wait around to be accepted as being something that you can um, culturally uh, be supported by. Uh, the whole notion of cinema, as, as with any art, is to stir the pot, is to create a revolution, is to, is to uh, point fingers at things and, and just say, no, I want to do something different. Um, otherwise, what's the point? We're just regurgitating, um, you know, just mundane mediocrity. Uh, so I'll certainly be fighting the good fight on my battlefield, and um, there'll be plenty more stuff coming out from my end. And, uh, yeah, I, I just want everyone to just lay down your guns and get along with each other and just concentrate on more meaningful endeavours. You know, we've lost the nobility. It's time mm -hmm. to reclaim that, um, and that means putting the focus and energy on more noble pursuits, um, you know, better, better yourself and, and uh, education, art and uh, beauty, uh, as opposed to going and destroying something and saying, yeah, that works. No, it don't. Well, take care. Uh, we've had quite a, quite a long uh, chat, uh, so, so, so we'll leave it at there. And yeah, I'm sure we'll, we'll definitely cross paths, uh, chat either on or off air in the future. Thanks, Tim. Thanks to the Unshackled too. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to Wilmsfront. Visit timwilms.com or Rational Rise TV to view the archive of episodes. And keep visiting theunshackled.net to view all our shows. And to keep up with the latest real news and analysis.